thank you so much for that introduction to the theme here today, Mark. I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, Jeffrey Sachs. Many of you know, is a world-renowned professor of economics, a leader in sustainable development, a senior UN advisor, a best-selling author, and syndicated columnist whose monthly columns appear in more than 100 countries. He is a special advisor to the UN Secretary General on the sustainable goals. He is the author of six books, including three bestsellers, the most recent of which is Building the New American Economy, Smart, Fair, and Sustainable. And he has his PhD from Harvard and is currently the university professor at Columbia University. Please welcome Jeffrey Sachs. spend a holiday day <laughs> talking about international development. That's how I spend all my holidays. I'm happy to be doing it together with you and uh, those who are online. It's a fun subject, it's fascinating, and it's also very, very important. And I think this paper gets it uh, just right in many ways. One is the idea of looking at these three periods of uh, broadly 1960 to 1980, 1980 to 2000, and then 2000 to now, because there really is a difference uh, for the so-called developing countries or the low and middle income countries and how economic performance uh, fared, and that tells a lot. And the second point is, uh, of course, a major emphasis on China, which is very appropriate for our world. China has become, by the metrics, for example, used by the IMF, which is a national uh, domestic or gross domestic product uh, value at international prices, the largest economy in the world during this period. So it's very important to understand uh, China's uh, economy and its success, especially over the last uh, 35 to 40 years in achieving rapid economic growth. It's also important to understand some of the limitations of China's uh, development patterns, especially around the environment and also income inequality, which I'll want to say a word about. And it's a good occasion with this paper to look forward. This is the IMF World Bank annual meetings uh, this week, and it is important what those institutions do, and I want to say a few words about that as well. <coughs> the period uh, 1980 to 2000 was not a good period for economic development, and there are many aspects uh, to that. Part of the certainly, as this paper uh, emphasizes, was the kind of economic model that was then called the Washington Consensus that was pounded uh, on uh, countries during those 20 years. That was the Reagan period. In some measure, we're not out of the Reagan era yet uh, because Reagan brought in the idea of uh, corporate rule and low and tax cuts for the wealthy is the dominant strategies for the economy, bashing trade unions and uh, raising the inequality of income. And the tax fight that we're in in the United States these days is exactly a continuation of that strategy. So Reagan really changed the political order and it hasn't changed back yet, and that's true democratic administrations as well, which have been, unfortunately, kind of soft uh, versions of uh, what has been fairly constant since the early 1980s. That was 
that model of uh, really hard corporate rule and cutting uh, social benefits was certainly uh, embodied in the uh, policies of the World Bank and the IMF for the 20-year period from the 19, from early 1980s uh, onward, and uh, that was the period when the World Bank said you have to raise uh, your own cost recovery in health clinics, you have to dismantle uh, public financing for social programs to uh, manage the budget deficit and so forth. Those were, for me, formative days of my own uh, career because I started, uh, uh, got my PhD in 1980, so I was able to both watch and participate in that period. And uh, I grew up uh, fighting the IMF in a lot of very specific cases uh, and came to understand that policy uh, close up. To understand it fully, it's important to add in one factor that hasn't you know, been mentioned yet. I don't think Mark mentioned it, but that was the developing country debt crisis, which came in 1982 in full form. The U.S. had had a high inflation rate in the 1970s, <coughs> partly around the breakup of the Bretton Woods institutions. Paul Volcker became uh, chair of the Fed. Uh, the Fed policy was to uh, really throttle the inflation by putting interest rates up to unprecedentedly high levels. A lot of developing countries had borrowed private and public uh, debt <coughs> in order to finance infrastructure or government deficits. When the Volcker interest rates rose to 12 or 15 or even 20 percent, these countries became both uh, illiquid and in many cases insolvent around 1982. And when Mexico uh, went into debt crisis in the middle of 1982, uh, <clears throat> that also led to a contagion of uh, pulling back on new lending or rolling over credit. So the developing country debt crisis became pervasive. The Reagan ideology combined with the debt crisis to lead to a pretty brutal crackdown on uh, developing countries and their public investments and their social services during that period because the IMF's strategy was force primary budget surpluses high enough so that these debts could be repaid. and. Uh, I saw that firsthand in Bolivia where I was helping a government to fight a hyperinflation. And as soon as the hyperinflation had stabilized in a very fragile way, the IMF demanded that Bolivia start repaying unpayable debts. I had a fit. Uh, this was my first development experience. And I said, no, there's no way you're going to collect from this impoverished country. And I had a big fight with them, and in the end, won that battle. Uh, I probably wouldn't be standing here if I had not won that battle. Uh, but in the end, Bolivia's debts were written down by about 90%. Uh, but other countries were not so lucky, uh, or were not so persistent, or were crushed under uh, the weight of U.S. foreign policy and the IMF and the World Bank. And it was a period of just trying to squeeze these countries turned out U.S. officials owned a lot of bank shares. And there, there was a lot of uh, conflict of interest and miserable U.S. economic policy uh, for quite a long time. We can be pretty brutal, our country, you know, uh, on, on many things, uh, often ending up trying to overthrow governments we don't like or bomb them. But uh, usually a step before that is to try to squeeze them in a very, very harsh way, and that was done for uh, a lot of countries. And when you crush public investment and public services, people become sick and die, children can't go to school, the water supply is dangerous, the sanitation fails, epidemics take place, and economic growth uh, collapses. And all of that happened 
throughout the developing countries. And that's why you see the 1980 to 2000 period as being a really, really tough period. Uh, and it, uh, this was all under so-called Washington consensus, which did not mean any kind of consensus except a few powerful people who, for whatever reason, were imposing this kind of strategy. And it failed very badly in many places. And I ended up fighting it without, I mean, it, it, by the early 1990s, it became clear to me much more than it was in 1985, 86, that it really was part of a power and ideological battle that was quite brutal. And I usually could win arguments if the countries I was dealing with were favorites of US foreign policy. But if they weren't, the battle was pretty brutal and usually unsuccessful because so much of how the IMF and the World Bank operate and operated then was under the thumb of US foreign policy for whatever purposes. So when I recommended Poland get debt relief, then the White House was quite cooperative and said, okay, that's a good policy because Poland was part of uh, America's foreign policy aims. When I recommended the same thing for Russia under Yeltsin in 1992, the answer was, hell no, why should we do that? And so it was rarely about economic development, it was about foreign policy. And it was about American power. And uh, the institutions reflected that and very, very badly. In 1997, the failure of this approach was again exposed with the Asian financial crisis, which was a crisis of how the financial system, starting in Wall Street with fragile interbank lending, could open itself up to financial panic. Just what we saw again in 2008. And after 2007, it was uh, not 1997, the Asian financial crisis. In my own analysis, I wrote pretty uh, harsh critiques. Why are you telling countries like Korea to squeeze in the middle of this kind of brutal crisis when the problem obviously was liquidity uh, and you needed a different approach from just jacking up interest rates, squeezing fiscal policy, and so forth. Well, by 2000, things had changed, actually, for a couple of reasons. One, this policy was a massive failure everywhere. And so the idea that you just brutalize countries to get them to pay debts was not good, working, and it wasn't viable. Second, Maybe because it was the year 2000 also, we had, a, we had some good support uh, from Pope John Paul II and others that the uh, new millennia, millennium needed to be different. And Kofi Annan said we needed a different uh, kind of a millennium afterwards. And I think the staff of the World Bank and IMF were quite demoralized also. It's not fun to have broken nasty programs all the time that are putting people's lives at threat and so on. So the Washington consensus, uh, Mark was a, a leader in fighting it, and I was pounding away, and others were pounding away. I think the Washington consensus uh, went into mostly uh, abeyance, not completely. Um, didn't change American policy so much, by the way, but in the rest of the world, uh, it changed. And we entered a, a new, more fruitful period of the Millennium Development Goals. And the Millennium Development Goals said, at least have goals more than just crushing countries or repaying debt. Have goals about economic development. And I take that to be very important because if we don't have objectives, then we will just get lost in power. But the Millennium Development Goals said fight poverty, fight disease, help kids get in school, fight unsafe water, promote sanitation. That was all good stuff. And it did play some role because we had HIPAA 
which was at least acknowledging that the poor countries that were highly indebted should get relief. So that was systemic. It never was deep enough, fast enough, bold enough to my taste, but it was at least a change that said we need to put actual outcomes as something of a priority. So I was lucky to work with Kofi Annan and, and Ban Ki-moon on the Millennium Development Goals, and I think some of that rebound in improving life expectancy, in reducing child mortality, was directly the result of a, an international framework that was more responsive to end purposes, not just to collecting debt. Of course, what Mark has said about China is also completely correct, but needs to be understood in, in, in the uniqueness of China as well. China's development is by far the most successful uh, development of such a scale in history, uh, with economic growth around 10% per year for roughly 35 years from 1978 to 2012-2013. And when you're growing at 10% per year, by the way, you're doubling every seven years. Uh, and if you do that for 35 years, that's five doublings. And so uh, that means two to the fifth power, or roughly a 32 time increase from 1978 till around uh, 2013 in aggregate uh, GDP, real GDP. It's an amazing accomplishment, and it had a huge uh, beneficial effect in reducing poverty. Uh, and uh, it uh, the most remarkable transformation of such a scale that the world has, uh, has ever seen. What was that model? Uh, it was really a complex, mixed economy, uh, complicated institutional model. If you want to find a role model for the Chinese model, I would say it is Japan. Uh, I always thought Japan invented this kind of rapid catching up growth, first in the Meiji Restoration after 1868, and then again in the 1950s and 1960s. Japan had its decade of doubling income under uh, Ikeda starting in 1962, and they had that incredible burst also. And it's a mix of industrial policy, a heavy emphasis on technology. If you talk to a if you talked to, as I did many times, uh, Japanese policymakers or Chinese policymakers, what would come out of their mouth wouldn't be markets, certainly wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be Washington consensus or Beijing consensus for that matter. It would be technology. How can we accelerate the technological upgrading? It is, by the way, a language still missing too much in Latin America uh, because Latin America doesn't relentlessly focus on good engineering and technology the way that Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, PRC, uh, Japan, and others have Singapore uh, to their benefit. So I think that that's a part of the China story. And it was an opening to the world and joining uh, the world economy through uh, global production uh, value chains and and uh, very sophisticated connectivity to uh, global markets that was quite successful. That's all on the good side. Let me mention two things that were not so much on the good side. This was basically coal-powered development. So China became perhaps the dirtiest country in the world also because of massive coal pollution, massive greenhouse gas emissions, massive air pollution, water pollution. Uh, it was go for growth and the environment will fix later. And we know that the deaths that come from that and the amount of disease is just too high to have that kind of strategy. And I think the Chinese government has realized that because nobody wants to breathe that air day in, day out. It's not safe. Uh, and you feel it when you're in Beijing. Uh, you just don't want to be in that environment and you can't 
take three days off and not breathe. Uh, you know, you're just uh, compelled to uh, suffer uh, the consequences of that. So I think the Chinese uh, uh, leadership has certainly come to understand this. The other thing that is a big problem also is that that rapid growth led to a lot of inequality because uh, while poverty was decisively reduced, there were some very big winners. China has its incredible new generation of billionaires. Uh, there is a, a big gap between the urban areas and those still in the rural areas. There's a big gap in education. Part of this is market-driven, but massive inequality. And China doesn't really have a social safety net. It has family saving. And that leads to massively high household saving, but not until very recently even a health care system that was publicly financed. And so this is something that China needs to grapple with as well. I think Mark is absolutely right uh, also to point out that simplistic ideas of uh, that there's only one way to grow. I regard Why Nations Fail as one of the very bad books about development. It's extremely naive, uh, and their only explanation of China is to say, well, it's going to fail. Well, I don't think so. Uh, but, you know, if you have a book that can't account for the last 40 years of the most important development event in the world, I don't think you really have the kind of uh, power of uh, insight that that book claims. So I always call it on my bad book list. Uh, it, it just is not accurate. It's so ideological. Uh, oh, it's got to be a free market, blah, 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 blah. Uh, inclusive institutions defined in a very unclear way to mean any place that succeeds sometimes. Uh, so uh, anyway, I, I think China really shows, like Japan, like Korea, uh, and so on, that the path to development, especially technology-led development, is definitely more complicated than any kind of simplistic first-year economics textbook free market model. It doesn't look much like that. On the other hand, let me say, not every country can do what China did. The scale of the domestic market, for example, act absolutely makes a big difference. And China has consciously created national champions to compete with American champions. Uh, so uh, if there's a Google and a Facebook and, uh, and uh, an Amazon, China has its uh, Tencent and Alibaba and uh, others. And, and that's come through industrial policy and blocking American companies for a while until the Chinese counterparts gain the strength of the global first national and now truly massive and massively successful global players. But if you were a country of five million, you could not do that the same way. So many things that China did, I would say don't do at home. Uh, it doesn't translate absolutely directly and specific to a particular set of conditions. I think they've uh, been very clever in a lot of policies, but it's not something that you can do at a small scale necessarily the same way all development needs uh, a more contextual institutional base. Finally, let me say a word about the IMF World Bank agenda going forward. Uh, and it's very relevant to all of this discussion. My belief in goal-based development is uh, very much amplified and, I believe, supported by this historical experience of the last 17 years. First, the Millennium Development Goals. Second, the kind of goals in China's five-year plans. Okay, that's a Chinese uh, institution, but God forbid the America should plan a little bit, you know. Uh, it doesn't have to be the morning tweet uh, and the afternoon counter tweet and the evening tweet. Is that the limit of our thinking? Really, it's a serious problem that we have no institutions that look ahead right now in this country. Uh, our, we have no planning institutions in Washington. 
don't hold your breath for a trillion dollars of infrastructure. That's not something that you get in 140 characters or even in the more generous 280 character <laughs> world that we're now in. You actually have to think. And Donald Trump is not capable of it, literally. Uh, and that, that's not a political observation. That is a psychological uh, characterization. He is not a reader, thinker, uh, has no capacity to lead us, but neither do our institutions right now. We are not looking ahead. That's a big worry. It's complete improv. Uh, morning, noon, and night. And it's all fake, you know, eight months, nine months for a tax reform proposal, and then they couldn't even have one table in it, one set of numbers. I would fail anybody that came after nine months with such a shoddy little paper. Now, of course, there's a, a reason to it. They're going to try to sneak $2 trillion in tax cuts by us in the middle of the night, somehow holding the votes. It's so corrupt and crooked. Of course, this is what Mr. Mercer and Mr. Adelson and Mr. Trump and a few other billionaires want to do. Somehow I'm hoping that our democratic institutions, that's small d, that's not a partisan statement, that somehow the shame of all of this, the disgusting, disgusting behavior holds out and says, no, we're not going to just give $2 trillion to rich people in the middle of the night. We have a little bit more sense and fortitude. But there was no planning in this. It's all made up. And they're trying to discredit the one institution, the Congressional Budget Office, that does not nonpartisan, forward-looking scenarios. They're trying to bash it because they know that if you tell the truth, this stuff can't get passed. Okay, what about the IMF and the World Bank? They need to think ahead, too. It's not enough that a country repays its debt. Sometimes I've said about IMF policies, all they want is low inflation and debt servicing. If you starve, just don't make a macro crisis of it. And that, I think it's better than that now. But still, what are the standards that should apply to an IMF program? Now, to my mind, there's an answer to that. We have global goals now. We had the 15 years of the Millennium Development Goals. Now we have the Sustainable Development Goals. They give clear goals. Every child should complete at least a secondary education. Universal health coverage. Everybody should have access to electricity. Renewable energy. Everybody should have safe water and sanitation. Okay, that costs money. So what I would like to see the IMF staff doing is instead of just balancing the books of extreme poverty, what they should be doing is asking how much does it cost to achieve these goals? And if the answer is, well, you can't do that and pay this debt back at the same time, it's unsustainable if you're going to make the investments needed for these goals, then the debt has to be reduced. That's how coherent public policy should be designed. Start with goals and then work out through good detailed, highly professional scenario building how to achieve those goals. And the World Bank also needs a different kind of strategy from saying, well, we have a certain amount of money to allocate to this country. What are you going to do with it? To, because that's maybe how a bank would behave. But it shouldn't be a bank. It should be a development institution. And it should say, OK, <coughs> We need to support countries to achieve the sustainable development goals. How should our lending capacity be devoted to success of the sustainable development goals? I can tell you that's not how the bank is working right now. It is not organized for helping their members to achieve success on the globally agreed goals. They don't have the scenarios. They don't have the rigor. They don't have the methodology to do that. So the one thing I want to say about this week's IMF World Bank meetings is here are two leading 
international financial institutions in a context where the world has unanimously adopted sustainable development goals and alongside it the Paris Climate Agreement. We need to have international finance based on achieving the goals we've set. That's the standard. And that means that the institutions have to change their the way they perform so that they are looking at how to achieve success for their member countries. If they do that, they will prove their worth. 